We've been going through the book of Acts, and we've really just kind of started. We've finished chapter one, and now we're in chapter two. And why is, why is this so important? This, you know, there was even a group. How many of you are old enough to remember a group called Second Chapter of? Yeah, you remember that group? Yeah. Why, why is this so important? You know, I think three things converge um, in this part of Scripture. That, that really create a powerful thing. One is salvation, because everybody, everybody in that upper room was saved. Understand what I mean when I say saved? They received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They saw the risen Lord. They had invited them into their hearts, and they were waiting. And then there was this thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which if you're like me, when I first got saved, was something really new and, dare I say, weird-sounding. All right? And then after that, everything exploded. The mission field exploded uh, with Christianity. But it wasn't until after this experience happened. Uh, And it was instrumental in the first church being the first church. And let me just back up a little. uh, This is kind of all new to you. Um, Acts is really the story of the church. It is the beginning of the church, kind of as we know it. It is also basically the beginning of missions as we know it. And they're closely tied together. And so we're going to, I'm going to cover this topic over a period of two weeks, because as I was preparing, I just didn't think I could do it justice in, uh, in one week. But let me go to this, this experience of baptism of the Holy Spirit. So how many, how many, you know, exactly what I'm talking about when I say that, how many say that's kind of brand new to me? A few, nobody's raising, nobody wants to admit it. Okay. That's all right. Let me read, uh, let me read this scripture because it tells us that it was not a one-time thing. All right. This is from Acts 19 and in Corinthians, we hear, we hear more about it and it's, it's kind of throughout, but let me just read from Acts 19 verses one and two. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. And there he found some disciples. (laughs) And he said to them, did you receive the Holy spirit when you believed? And they said, and I love this line. I love this line. Nope. We've not even heard if there is a Holy spirit. That's kind of how I was. I never heard of a Holy spirit. And in, in my day, they called it the Holy ghost, which really was a little frightening. All right. I, I never even heard whether there was a, a Holy Spirit. And, uh, but Jesus had told his disciples back in Acts 1.8 that something incredible was going to happen. They would receive the dynamite power of the Holy Spirit. Wait, don't go without it. Don't try to start churches without it. Don't go on the mission field without it. Don't even leave this room until you have it. Because it is imperative for you to be successful on the task I've given to you. So this is how I would like you to approach. If this is kind of new to you, or if you're kind of like this, can I suggest this? Um, I've mentioned this name several times, Josh McDowell. Some of you know who Josh McDowell is. Um, he, was he was one person who decided he was going to, he kept hearing about Christianity, and he's, I believe he was in pre-law, but I'm not absolutely sure about that. But he approached it, he approached Christianity and this whole idea of being saved and who Jesus was. Was he really the savior of the world? He, appro- he, he said, I'm going to investigate this and I'm going to prove it wrong, just like you would prove in a court of law that it is wrong. I'm, I'm going to prove it wrong. And as he investigated it, he, he actually proved that it wasn't wrong. And he's got books out that, and I love them, and they, they go through that. But here's the point. <laughs> he went through it. With an, with a, his mind actually wasn't open. I'm going to ask that you keep an open mind. But his mind was pretty closed, but God opened it up as he investigated. Another one, kind of the same story, is Lee Strobel. Have you heard of Lee Strobel? Case for Christ, case for Christmas, case for Easter. He has a case for everything. Kind of his trademark. But he was a newspaper reporter, Chicago newspaper reporter. His wife started going to uh, a ladies' meeting and when she would come home, 
All she wanted to talk about was Jesus and what she was learning in her ladies' meeting. How many think ladies' meetings are good? Linda, what do you think? Ladies' meeting's good? She leads the group on uh, Wednesday morning. And so he said, well, I'm going to go after this, just like I would go after investigative reporting, I'm, like I would investigate the mayor, or like I would investigate an alderman, or like I would investigate a crime or misuse of money in Chicago. I'm going to go after this, just like I went after uh, those things. And he came back with kind of the same story as Josh McDowell. I would say, as we, we begin, some of this may be very new for some of you, might be very old for some of you, I don't, I don't know, but with the same kind of spirit of pursuing, can you just have that in mind as we go through this? Don't, in other words, if you close everything off at the beginning, uh, we won't, it, it won't go anywhere. Nothing will happen. You have to have that kind of open. So let me just tell you my, part of my story. Um, when Jody started sharing with me this idea of the whole, I thought she was nuts when she said, um, well, you can love without expecting anything return, in return. It's called agape love. And I thought, no. <laughs> no. Agape love. What? Yeah, you can love without expecting anything returned. Never heard of that. Sounds crazy. And then, when I got by that, started sharing that there, there is a Holy Ghost. Except she didn't use ghost. She was smarter than me. She, she used a more modern translation. Holy Spirit. Then I really thought she was crazy. Well, she was cute and still is. So I did just that. I got every book I could get my hands on that talked about, you know, this experience of the Holy Spirit is real and for today. And I got a hold of everyone that said, nope, it ended with the disciples. And I read them all. And then as a last step, I read the book of Acts straight through. And when, it was when I read the book of Acts and read about, well, that one scripture I just read, well, we haven't even heard whether there's a, there's a Holy Spirit. That wasn't at the day of Pentecost. That was after the day of Pentecost. And I thought, all through here, it's kind of sprinkled in. How can, it must be real. And so that was my beginning of a pursuit. And uh, so let's, uh, let's uh, go through and uh, go through some uh, scripture here. Uh, the story is really only in 13 verses, okay? If you've got Acts up in your Bibles, Look at all these new matching Bibles up here. Hold those up. Those are so cool. Those, those are the real thing. Those look like swords right there, my friends. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, bringing your Bible isn't a bad thing, all right? It's a good thing because you can write in your Bible. Uh, I use my pad for a lot of things, but you can write in a, in a Bible, and it's helpful. And the more I write, the more I remember. So for me, maybe your brain works different, but the more I write things down, the more I remember it. And so for me, that's good. So let's just read the story in Acts chapter two. And I'll, I'll say to uh, anybody front row and all the rest of the rows and up in the balcony, never be afraid to look in an index. And if you got some really smart Christian next to you, tell them you want, th want them to help you find Hezekiah. All right. Here's what it says, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Now, it was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It wasn't necessarily a mighty rushing wind. You know, when a tornado comes, what do they say it sounds like? A train. It's the sound of a train, but it's not a train. It's a, tor it's a tornado. So there could be a correlation uh, there was a sound like a mighty Russian wind, and it filled the house where they were all sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all what? Well, what? <clears throat> filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to what? Yeah. Seems weird. As the Spirit gave them utterance. And now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered. 
like I was bewildered. Because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and astonished. Are these not, uh, are not all these who were speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear them in our own native language? And he lists all these different languages. But by the way, just let me add this. They all spoke Greek as well. All right. Because when Peter preached, he spoke in one language. So they all, they, they all understood Greek. It was kind of the common language, but they had their own dialects and areas. Uh, so there are all these people visiting Rome, Jews and proselytes, and just from all over, I'm not going to read all of them. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? And others were mocking and said, they're drunk. <laughs> this is so crazy. They're, that doesn't say, it says they're filled with, filled with new wine, which means that. So Pentecost, what is Pentecost? Pentecost was, they would count the weeks and days uh, from the Passover, and that would lead you to a festival called the uh, Festival of the Harvest or First Fruits. We call it Pentecost Sunday in our, uh, in our denomination. And uh, uh, so it's, it's a festival. It was a big, the second most important festival on the Jewish calendar after Passover. So it was a very important time, and there's lots of people coming to Jerusalem, to uh, the city, on a pilgrimage to be there during this time. Jody and I, by the way, went to see the movie Route 60, uh, which is Mike Pompeo and one of the, uh, the ambassador to Israel, the former ambassador to Israel. And they kind of did a, it was at, we went to Morris to see. It was there for one or two days. Uh, but it was really good to be able to see where did things happen in the Old Testament? Where did things happen in the New Testament? What's going on over there today? What did it look like? When they say mount, what did it look like to be on a mount and to be shouting from one mount to another and all of that? I, I found it fascinating. <clears throat> so anyhow, Pentecost was a festival. That's, everybody's in the city. And, uh, but on this day, at this time, with those 120 people that were in this room, maybe even in, a, in the temple, uh, because of the number of people there, uh, the, what, what, I, I mentioned this a couple weeks, what house could hold 120 people on the roof and actually support that? You remember one time when they lowered somebody through the roof so that Jesus could touch them, they just pulled straw off the roof and you know, lowered the person down. So some roofs you could walk on, but 120 people. So some people say it was probably in one of the rooms of the, the temple. But there were manifestations that happened. One of them that was audible, which I've already mentioned, wind. Uh, the word for wind and spirit is pneuma. You know what word we get from that? Where's, where's my uh, car mechanics? Pneumatic. Or carpenters. Pneumatic. Air. Air. So th that, that comes from that root word. There was visual. There was something that looked like fire that would land it on their heads. It's really, really something. And, uh, you know, fire... Uh, symbolizes courageousness and, and, and here witnesses. And then there was this phenomenon called tongues or speech when they, when they spoke in other languages that uh, there some of the crowd actually understood. So that's kind of what happened here. But let's zoom out for just a minute because it is also the beginning of something else that was mentioned in the Old Testament. In Joel 2.28, it says this, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Woo. That's a prophecy of something that's to come. And they were excited about this prophecy. This was something they looked forward to. And this is the beginning of that period of time. So what can we say here? Everybody has to decide to repent and receive Jesus. It's a personal thing. Grandma can't do it for you. Mom can't do it for you. How many times do somebody will say, and this is the pastor of Praise Center Church, and they'll say, oh, yeah, my grandma went to church. She was real religious. Okay, how about you? <laughs> you know, how you doing? All must decide to re repent and receive Jesus. Here, the disciples receive power to do the job that God had called them to do, that Jesus had said for them to do. How many know that we have a job today, too? 
It has it, go ye into all the world and what? Preach the gospel to who? Everybody. Everybody. You know, as uh, Mac and Terry and myself, you know, we all, we all take tests to get our uh, pastor's credentials. And one of, the, one of the classes is the history of the church, but also the history of our denomination. And our denomination traces its roots uh, way back there uh, to a place called Azusa. And uh, in uh, 1914, the Assemblies of God grew out of that time. And out of that came this acceptance of this particular scripture and doctrine. We believe that this experience is for today. And we believe that when we receive the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to explain that a little bit more here in a minute, that the purpose is that we can be witnesses. The purpose isn't that we can go around and say, I got this, you don't have it, I, I got more power than you do. No, you don't, yes, I do. That's not the reason. The reason is so that we can be the most effective witnesses for God that we can. And out of that grew the missions um, area in, the, in our denomination that said this missions is up here above all other things because we need the experience and we need missions is what God wants us to do. And the Assemblies of God, um, I don't know from when to when, but, but has been the fastest missions growing denomination forever and ever. Amen. But it's because it is connected to having the power to be able to do what God has called us to do. So, um, and it's in this time that the Holy Spirit reveals my, his purpose is in salvation and the disciples receive this uh, same longing. But these disciples also led others to the same experience that they had received at Pentecost. So, all must repent because we need the power to witness and bring conviction, and we get that through the Holy Spirit. Now, the other thing I want to say is the Holy Spirit. I know the word ghost is used, but that's a translation thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. God the Father, God the Son, and something else I don't understand. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. A, a, a person in the Godhead. And the Holy Spirit has been here from the very beginning. Remember, the Spirit moved over the waters, uh, even back in Genesis. So this isn't a new, the Holy Spirit is not a new phenomena that just came uh, here. It's, the Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force as a matter of fact, Jesus said, you know, if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit can't come. And so Jesus went and the Holy Spirit came. In Acts 5, uh, I'm going to jump ahead here in Acts a few times. It says this, Ananias, uh, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You remember, remember that story? Uh, oh, they, what did they do? They sold, they sold some property and they, they tried to not, uh, give according to what they had sold. So they didn't tithe on it or, but th that wasn't the point. The point was they lied about what they did. All right. So they came and they said, oh yeah, we received this much. And so this is what we're given to the, uh, to the evangelistic effort. And uh, right away, the spirit revealed that that wasn't accurate. And so anyhow, it says this, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? By the way, we're not doing a special offering after this. <clears throat> While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? You can do whatever you want. After it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Holy Spirit revealed that. So let's, uh, let's go on here. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Um, 
here's two definitions that you kind of, there's a couple things you have to have as kind of an understanding of what this is all about. One, we all receive the Holy Spirit when we're born again. It's the Holy Spirit that draws us to God. So there is, and, and some denominations will point to this and say, we receive the Holy Spirit here, we don't need it here. All right, I'm saying there are two different experiences. They're similar, but different. There's being born of the Spirit when we're born again as Christians, receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and then there's filled with the Holy Spirit, which is like what happened at Pentecost with the disciples. Me too, Keith. John 3, it says, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one of you is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then in Acts, it says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they're born of water and the Spirit at salvation, but yet the disciples had another experience at Pentecost. With me? Even the spirit of truth who the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria until the ends of the earth. So I will propose that there are two different experiences here and I'll, I'll back that up a little more here in a minute. But the first experience at salvation, second experience when we're actually baptized, which means to be immersed in the Holy Spirit. Here's two extremes. Extreme number one, there is no such thing as an experience subsequent to salvation. In other words, Pentecost, uh, we're going to skip that part. Or it was just what often is said, is it was just for that time, but not beyond that time. That's one position. The other position is, unless you are filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit after salvation, you do not have the Holy Spirit at all. That is not true. So the two extremes, you don't want to be on either side of that, because Scripture teaches there is an experience at salvation, and there is the Holy Spirit is involved, and there is an experience post-salvation. Jody ran into the critics when she was in college. Before, not me, okay. <laughs> Stop pointing. Um, there were some Christian groups in college that when they found out that she accepted the doctrine that I'm explaining here, Pentecost, uh, they wouldn't let her pe be part of the group because it was considered a cult. But after the Assemblies of God started being so effective in missions and evangelism, there was, uh, it was obvious something else was going on that then others began to look at. And eventually, although they may not agree exactly with the doctrine, they no longer reject it. All right. But we remember the day, Jody, back in the 70s, uh, when that was not the case. So the critics will say that. Um, born of the Spirit. For in one spirit, we were all baptized. This is in 1 Corinthians. Skipping ahead to Corinthians. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews, Greeks, slaves, and free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Again, baptized means to be dipped or immersed. And so even when we do water baptism here, we immerse whenever possible. I don't think, I had one person who had cancer, couldn't be immersed, and so we sprinkled him. Because there's no reason not to be baptized, in, in my view. But by and large, immersion is the way, because that's what the word means. Filled with the Spirit, John answered him saying, I baptize you water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So when Jesus comes, things, things change, they elevate, they move up. So, 
And again, a reminder what it said in Acts chapter 1. And while they were staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Let's look at Jesus, like maybe something you haven't thought of. It's at the birth of Jesus, and it's found in Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to skip some verses here. Oh, boy. Her husband, I'm going to go to verse 19. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from who? The Holy Spirit. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. That's when his ministry began. So he had the Holy Spirit when he was born, conceived of the Holy Spirit, but then later on, the Holy Spirit descends on him, boom, he goes to ministry. Isn't that what happened here in Pentecost? They waited. They had already received Jesus as Lord and Savior. Boom, the Holy Spirit comes on them. Wow, they go out, and all of a sudden, the church becomes a powerful thing. The disciples, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the father has sent me. So I'm sending you. And when he had said this, <coughs> he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy spirit. This is, this is at the beginning of their walk. And then the day they was in acts again, chapter one, uh, verse two, until the day when he was taken up. And after he had given commands through the Holy spirit to the apostles, whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them for 40 days. Imagine that. And speaking about the kingdom of God, Jesus appearing to them afterwards. They find him alive. And then he's speaking to them about the kingdom of God. And while he was staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you heard from me, John baptized with water. And you were baptized. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Let me go back to this from the first week. How many of you like waiting? So Jesus, well, they're all excited. Jesus is walking on the earth with them again, and he's speaking to them, and he's teaching them, and, he, and, and then he says, look, I'm going to go away, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to wait. Because wait for this, and then boom, he's gone. And then they're like, how long? Can we eat? We stay in one place the whole time? What kind of food do they have? Didn't really say how long. But Pentecost, Pentecost was the, was the day. I mean, they could have waited for three days and said, well, nothing happened. Let's go back. Let's do some fishing. Let's go back to what we were doing. Maybe we heard him wrong. Maybe we missed it. With this whole concept of baptism of the Holy Spirit, doubt often arises. Uh, because it's an experience and we're we're releasing control of something that we don't like to release control of. Remember in the Bible, it says the tongue, who can control the tongue? And the, the tongue, it's like the, the tongue is a hard thing it, and it's the rudder that steers the ship. And it, it kind of, it's a hard thing to control. And we have trouble releasing that control. Um, let me move on here. Samaritans had some of that same experience. Um, the disciples, had, the Samaritans uh, had the experience. The Ephesians uh, had the experience. It says in Acts 19, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? This is one I read earlier. And they said, no, we haven't heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and then later, it says on hearing this, they're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then it says, and when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them 
and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. This is after, after the fact, after Pentecost, that this happened. And this is, this is some of the verses that I read years and years ago that convinced me even more than the books, because the books, there's good arguments on both sides. Uh, so the books kind of left me neutral. But when I read the scripture for myself, and I'll just tell you, that's how I landed on the fact that I believe it's real. Now, now that I believe it's real, is it real for me or is it just real for everybody else? Is it real for the super holy ones like Jody? You know, she never came across that way. Wilfredo well, de Jesus was a pastor in, in the Chicago area. I believe Terry and I went there to his church together. Didn't we, Terry? Was it you and me that did that? And uh, he's now one of the executive officers with the Assembly of God. And uh, I have a uh, video clip of him speaking to this subject. Would you give a listen? speak in another language, and I know it wasn't Spanish because I'm Hispanic, that what I saw began to uh, maybe cause some fear that I created some wars that uh, I, I thought this can't be real, this cannot be God. Until the curiosity of me and said, wait a minute, what if this is, this is the war? And I remember that um, going to the altar myself, curious about this experience that people were having, that I too wanted this. And, and the Holy Spirit is about being filled in the Holy Spirit, walking in the Holy Spirit. And, um, and I remember going to the altar and I was there for at least an hour and a half to two hours, praying and crying. And, and it was there that I experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues. And that, real, that marked me for the rest of my life. That marked me, that experience is what catapulted me going forward being filled with the Holy Ghost, giving me boldness, giving me the words and the strength to talk in my, in my city. And so for me, that would be my experience uh, of the Holy Spirit. Stand with me, if you would, please. There are so many... Uh... So many different testimonies. Jody, Jody, I'm going to hold that till next week. Uh, so many different testimonies. I read through 20 different testimonies of people and how they received the Holy Spirit. By the way, one of our students received the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, yesterday. Yesterday? Yes, yesterday. And uh, it's just so exciting. And I, I think maybe we'll hear, hear from the student next week. So we'll see. When you take a lot of testimonies and you push them together, here's what you find. About three quarters did not begin praying in tongues when they first desired. Uh, it, took, uh, it took a little time. About three quarters received the gift of tongues at home while they were alone. About 50% said they would have spoken in tongues earlier had they known about it. Nobody told them. Have you heard whether... Have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? I haven't heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. You know, it's that concept. 50% specifically mentioned that they had to battle, battle with fear and doubt that caused them to resist baptism in tongues for a period of time. About 50% specifically mentioned that they experienced intense emotion when baptized in the Holy Spirit, meaning probably 50% didn't experience, you know, the fireworks going off. That's okay. About one quarter specifically mentioned that deliverance opened up the Holy Spirit's blood. In other words, if there's an addiction to pornography or other things, that is going to be a big roadblock in, in your spirit. You have to deal with that first. But all said, there has been an amazing impact of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, 
I would like the privilege of praying for you and with you because it's the most important thing that we can do right now. And I, like I said, I'm going to spread this over a couple weeks because it's a big topic, and for some it's, it's a new topic. But uh, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads for a moment. And Terry, if you've got some music back there you can play, just uh, have a little music playing here. If you're one of those ones who said, you know, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit years ago, but I really haven't done much with it since. And I'm going to talk about the difference between speaking in tongues when you're baptized and speaking in tongues as a prayer language, all right, or even as prophecy. Uh, I'll talk about that a little more next week. But I'm talking specifically now about the initial physical evidence of baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is speaking in tongues. If you've had that experience, but you've kind of not exercised it, just with heads bowed, eyes closed, would you just slip your hand up? I, I would like to pray with you first. Yes, I see. Others? I see. Thank you. Others? Yes, thank you. Congregation, could we just begin praying and praising the Lord? And I just want to offer a prayer for these that they've already received. I'm just going to pray that God would just loose, uh, loose the spirit inside of them, if that's a, a correct term. And that once again, uh, we would use a gift that God has given us. Would you pray with me, Father? I thank you for the many that raised hands. And uh, Lord, you gave us these gifts for a reason. You gave us gifts to do the, every one of the gifts whether it's leadership or teaching, uh, any of the gifts, they're given to, to further your work. And we need all of them. We need all of them active. We don't, each one of us, but we need all of them active. And Lord, I pray that for all of those that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, that that would not be a one-time experience, but will be used throughout prayer and at times in their life. Lord. May that just be open. Church, just pray. Would you just pray? Just pray in the natural, and if you have the gift of tongues, just pray. Just pray. Just pray in that gift. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And let me ask this question now. I wonder how many of here would be brave enough to say, you know what, I, th I believe this is real, but I haven't experienced it, and I'm a little scared here. Would you pray with me? Would you just slip your hand up? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Just pray this prayer with me. All you down, down here. Dear Father God, I ask you in Jesus' name to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that I may receive the fullness of your Spirit. Lord, I want to have power to witness for you. I want to be able to praise you from my inmost being. I want to be able to speak your word boldly. Jesus, I believe you are the baptizer. I ask that you baptize me in the spirit right now. I believe and I receive the Holy Spirit now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, only you know the work you're beginning right now. O only you, you understand. But Lord, I know this. I know that it is still your heart during this period of time that we're in that people become Christian, that they become fully devoted followers of Christ. And Lord, we believe that in and of ourselves, we do not have the strength or the ability to do that. So thank you that you promised the gift of the Holy Spirit. And from all the examination that I can do, that this initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues is part of it as we release ourselves. Lord, I pray that as we go, this would not be the end, but the beginning of a journey for many. And maybe many others that did not raise their hands or come forward. Lord, thank you for our students that often lead the way. Yes. And uh, we thank you 
for their openness to you. And may that be an example to those of us that have been around the block a few times. Bring us back next week. May we see evidence of your great power, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.